Hello and welcome to podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. When you're ready to launch your next app or you want to try a project you hear about on the show, you'll need somewhere to deploy it. So take a look at our friends over at Linode. With 200 gigabit private networking, scalable shared block storage, node balancers, and a 40 gigabit public network, all controlled by a brand new API, you've got everything you need to scale up. And for your tasks that need fast computation, such as training machine learning models or running your CI pipelines, they just launched dedicated CPU instances. In addition to that, they just launched a new data center in Toronto, and they've got one opening in Mumbai at the end of 2019. Go to pythonpodcast.com slash linode, that's L-I-N-O-D-E, today to get a $20 credit and launch a new server in under a minute. And don't forget to thank them for their continued support of the show. And to keep track of how your team is progressing on building new features and squashing bugs, you need a project management system that can keep up with you that's designed by software engineers for software engineers. Clubhouse lets you craft a workflow that fits your style, including per-team tasks, cross-project epics, a large suite of pre-built integrations, and a simple API for crafting your own. With such an intuitive tool, it's easy to make sure that everyone in the business is on the same page. Podcast.net listeners get two months free on any plan by going to pythonpodcast.com slash clubhouse today and signing up for a free trial. And you listen to this show to learn and stay up to date with the ways that Python is being used, including the latest in machine learning and data analysis. For even more opportunities to meet, listen, and learn from your peers, you don't want to miss out on this year's conference season. We have partnered with organizations such as O'Reilly Media, Dataversity, and the Open Data Science Conference. Coming up this fall is the combined events of Graph Forum and the Data Architecture Summit. The agendas have already been announced, and Super Early Bird registration is available until July 26th, where you can get up to $300 off, or the Early Bird pricing for $200 off is available through August 30th. Use the code BNLLC to get an additional 10% off any pass when you register. Go to pythonpodcast.com slash conferences to learn more about this and the other conferences and take advantage of our partner discounts when you register. And also, the Python Software Foundation is the lifeblood of the community, supporting all of us who want to run workshops and conferences, run development spritz or meetups, and they also ensure that PyCon is a success every year. They have extended the deadline for their 2019 fundraiser until June 30th, and they need help to make sure they reach their goal. Go to pythonpodcast.com slash PSF 2019 today to make a donation. And if you're listening to this show after June 30th of 2019, then consider making a donation anyway. And you can visit the site at pythonpodcast.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the mailing list, read the show notes, and get in touch. And if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, I'd love to hear them. And to help other people find the show, please leave a review on iTunes and tell your friends and coworkers. Your host, as usual, is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Meredith Luff about Anvil, a platform for building full-stack web applications entirely in Python. So, Meredith, could you start by introducing yourself? Hi, hi Tobias. Thanks for having me. Uh, so, my name is Meredith. I'm from Cambridge in the UK, and for the last few years, I suppose, uh, my primary identity has been I run Anvil. It's a tool for building full-stack web apps with nothing but Python. And do you remember how you first got introduced to Python? So this is an odd confession, this early in a Python-focused podcast, but Python wasn't like a central language for me initially. Uh, So Anvil originally started when a friend and I, uh, Ian Davis, my co-founder with whom whom I've known for years and years, um, we we did our PhDs uh, together at Cambridge, and we spent a lot of time grousing about web development. And there's a lot to grouse about at web development, and I'm sure I'll get round to that later. But eventually, we decided to uh, stop grousing and actually spend some of our project time building something we thought would be better. And so we were looking at this tangle of applications, you know, languages and frameworks. And I mean, if you think about the web, it's ridiculous, right? The sort of the entry requirement for building a web application is HTML, CSS, JavaScript, uh, something on the server side, maybe Python, maybe Ruby, maybe something else, SQL for your database. That's five different programming languages just to get started. And then you've got a framework for pretty much all of those, right? You've got something like um, React for JavaScript and Bootstrap for CSS, and maybe Redux for JavaScript as well. And then maybe something like Django or Flask for the Python, maybe something like SQL Alchemy for uh, for the database. And we were 
looking at that going, well, hang on a sec. Back in the 1990s, right, when, when we started programming, you could pick up a tool like Visual Basic or Delphi and one language would be enough to, not just one language, in fact, but just being able to program a bit would be enough to build a whole application that worked the same as every other application on your desktop. And in those days, that was Windows desktop apps. And these days, the bar for doing that is so much higher. And, you know, none of that's like, okay, some of it is, but most of it is not inherent complexity. It's incidental complexity. It's accidental. It's nothing, none of the complexity you're dealing with is really necessary to express the application you want. And we thought that's something we should bring to the web. And so the moment we thought of that, that's really where we thought, well, okay, we're going to want to unify this in one language because one of the problems is all these languages coming out of your ears. What would be the obvious language? And we very quickly decided on Python, even though it wasn't either of our primary languages at that point, because it was so obviously best suited to the task. It is so approachable to people who are uh, used to different languages. It's the world's favorite uh, first language. And it's if you're trying to reduce complexity, then like picking a language that prioritizes simplicity and readability was an obvious choice. And so that's the point where we actually really got into Python. Uh, Ian likes to joke that I learned Python by hacking on a compiler for it, which isn't quite accurate, but it's not a million miles off the truth. <laughs> It's always interesting to start trying to learn a new concept or technology by going from the bottom up instead of the top down. So <laughs> that's it. Yeah, I, I tangled with Python before a little bit. Uh, so I, I vaguely knew what, what uh, I was doing. But yes, uh, that was enormously fun. And so can you talk a bit more about what Anvil itself is at this point? And uh, you've already shared a bit of the story about how it got started, but maybe some more of the actual early days of Anvil. Sure. So uh, so Anvil is it's two things, really. It's a web-based development environment, so an IDE, where you can build applications in your browser with uh, nothing but Python. And then it's a run hosting runtime environment where you can uh, deploy them. So... The idea is instead of instead of the normal web stack where you have you know your data starts as rows in a database, then you have to turn that into model you know, model objects on the server, and then you turn that into like JSON over HTTP, and you turn that into JavaScript objects, and you turn that into HTML DOM, and you turn that into pixels. We wanted a unified representation, so it's Python objects everywhere, it's Python code everywhere. So if you use Anvil, you pull up. Anvil.works, you open up the IDE, you use a drag and drop designer to design your user interface. Uh, and then if you double click a button or something similar, you're then editing Python code that runs in the browser when the user opens your app. And then with one function call, you can get to Python code running on the server. So hosted in a serverless environment by us. And that is how you build your application. So instead of all these different forms for your data to be in, your data is in Python objects being manipulated by Python code right the way through. And then, of course, one-click uh, deployment, and your app is live on the internet. So the impetus behind creation, as I mentioned earlier, was uh, Visual Basic and Delphi and similar environments, there were tons of them, allowed you to get from zero to a working application with, you know, sometimes with only a bit of programming knowledge. Sometimes you knew, knew a lot of programming, but you were just in a hurry. Uh, and we really wanted to replicate that experience. So the idea really started uh, shortly after Ian and I finished our PhDs. Uh, he, his PhD is in human-computer interaction. Mine is in usable programming systems. So we had spent a significant amount of time griping about uh, web usability. And uh, at a certain point, uh, we just said the thing that needs to exist, Visual Basic for the web. And we started it as a kind of hobby project in like evenings and weekends on the basis that, you know, even if nothing else came of it, this is a thing that it will be totally worth us building and putting out there because we would use it even if nobody else would. And then uh, I, after, you know, several months of development, I think over a year, uh, we finally put up a, a link to it on Reddit and discovered that we were not the only ones out there who were very enthusiastic about this. And from that point, we went, okay, hey, this is a real thing now. We should make a proper go of this. And so we went full-time on the project and 
uh, we have been ever since, really. And so for the initial development period, were you just doing it sort of nights and weekends in addition to whatever you were doing as full-time work? Or did you have sort of a seed amount of money that you could use to support yourselves while you were getting this off the ground? Uh, we are incredibly lucky to be entirely bootstrapped, actually. So uh, we didn't have to go getting, you know, getting seed money or permission from anybody to do it. Uh, it was just as you say, nights and weekends. I was uh, consulting at the time. And so I just took myself down to four and three and two and one days a week. Ian was working as a postdoc at the university, uh, which is a very flexible thing. And he just went down to four days a week on that. Uh, the company is actually called the Tuesday Project because it was always Tuesdays that we met up to work on it. And even when it wasn't a Tuesday, we just we relabeled uh, whichever day it was to be Tuesday for the purposes of scheduling. <laughs> That's an interesting little tidbit of background information. <laughs> yeah, and so we we worked up, and it was it was great, honestly, having a cushion like that. I mean, it's sort of both hackneyed to say and somehow underappreciated that there's there are very few fields in which you can do that. I mean, spinning something like this out of thin air in in nights and weekends is possible. We are extremely lucky as a profession as a whole that this is an option. And I am personally extremely grateful that we didn't have to go do a song and dance to investors. We could sort of slowly and methodically build something that we thought was technically right before we started doing the um, uh, sprint to customers, pivot, pivot sort of thing. <laughs> and so in terms of the early launch of Anvil, you mentioned that you posted it on Reddit, but I'm curious what the sort of early days of users coming onto the system looked like both in terms of volume and in terms of the overall load on the platform and any early assumptions that were challenged and needed to be reconsidered as you continued to build and grow the product. Absolutely. So when we first put it out there, we had, you know, we had some ideas. We thought, well, this would be a platform for simplicity. And we, you know, we, we, the thing we put out there was the smallest thing we thought was even slightly usable. And we very, very rapidly learned what the biggest missing things were. And I mean, honestly, when we put it up on Reddit, just to be clear, like this is a point that I don't think there was even a payment page, right? There was a sort of free for non-commercial use, contact us if you want the, if you want to use this commercially, sort of that level of maturity. We're not talking a polished product. But so in the original incar incarnation, when we were first say, playing with this in nights and weekends, we were thinking that the biggest problem was in the front end and you know that actually uh, if we sort of built something that people uh, design their UIs without writing HTML and write front end behavioral code without having to write JavaScript and communicate with server side code uh, without having to deal with HTTP and REST and mashing everything into JSON on the way. We thought that would be the big problem. We actually discovered that there was still a whole bunch of unsolved stuff on the server side. We originally shipped Anvil with like a built-in ability to like to, to back your applications off like Google Sheets because we were thinking, okay, databases are too complicated, but you know, you should be able to at least read and write spreadsheets. And if you, you know, if you're a beyond that, then you'll know how to use databases. And uh, one of the things we very rapidly discovered is in fact that's not true and there was a uh, quite a craving for, you know, okay, so how do I how do I set up a real database? Oh, you mean I have to go to RDS and, you know, to start up a virtual machine and put Postgres on it. And, you know, the, we realized that that was much causing people in the wild much more pain than we thought it was. And so I think, think that was the biggest thing. It was realizing that there were backend headaches to solve as well as front-end ones. And that was basically, so we, we put it, we put it up on Reddit in, uh, I think it was May of 2016, and we did get some customers. And this is something that I don't, I've been involved in a couple of startups, and this is a, uh, this is one of those merciful things the universe sometimes does to you. We picked up very quickly a couple of really great customers who are exactly who we thought, you know, would benefit from Anvil. Just to like, just to give us a little bit of encouragement to show that. Um, Sure enough, this was possible. And, you know, they were paying us some tiny number of bucks per month. And then after that, it was, you know, a long fallow period because we, you know, we were 
engineers and researchers and we had no idea how to you know get out there get in front of people's faces make some buzz we just built something and that little burst of interest we got we got once um got us you know some like sl- low trickle of um google traffic and like one or two perfect customers to reassure us that we were onto something and then the next few months was a long slog of building a bunch of stuff that we knew we were desperately lacking and i'd say like the the platform started to become i mean i am i'm really astonished by the tenacity of some of those early users looking back now how you know how much that we still had to do that they actually that they stuck with it and were able to do such amazing things with it in sort of summer late 2016 but within a few months we'd filled in the biggest gaps and then we felt like we were okay we were ready to sort of (laughs) go back to the well if you if you like and say okay this is actually uh we we've learned it was a good idea now it's usable (laughs) so web applications in general come in a pretty wide range of varieties and categories from just a simple web form up to fully interactive, immersive experiences powered heavily with JavaScript. And so I'm wondering what the primary format of web applications are that Anvil supports building and the limitations in terms of what is sort of easy to build because anything is possible, but what is sort of easy and uh, well-trodden in terms of the formats of applications that Anvil is designed to help people build? So I should start by saying that of course, you should be able to do everything with Anvil, and anything you can't do is a bug report. Frankly, things it's not straightforward to do are bug reports too. Having said which, the the sort of the most common use case we see of Anvil is for single page applications. So you go to the application, it loads this um, there's Python code that runs in your browser, and you sort of uh, you interact with that. So it's not like a page based paradigm. It's you know it's an application you open. So it's not specifically geared towards like you know a content driven websites right you know you you wouldn't run bbc news website on it but you would write a mail client in it that kind of thing as you've alluded to a lot of applications do end up having having quite deep needs of the the web api frameworks so the web is an extremely deep and complex development environment right there is a lot to it this is i mean Part of the problem with the complexity is there is so much to it. And Anvil is necessarily an abstraction over the web. You know, we take the web in all its complexity of all these different programming languages and all these different network protocols, and we present you with a way of using this that is much less complicated. And the trade-off to that is, of course, that abstraction is never going to be complete. You're, you know, there's always going to be something that you can do with native JavaScript, for example, that you can't do with Anvil. Or indeed, you know, something you can do with certain pieces of server-side code that you can't do in our serverless environment. We try very hard to make sure there is always an escape hatch. So there's this happy path of, you know, all my components are Python, everything was designed with a drag and drop designer, everything runs in my serverless environment. But at each of those points, if you realize that you need something the abstraction doesn't give you, you can reach out an escape hatch and use the native underlying functionality. So for example, recently, right, uh, Somebody wanted to use Bokeh, I think it's pronounced, the uh, visualization library. And, you know, we don't have native support for that. We do have native support for Plotly. You can just drag and drop it in, use the Python API. We don't have we don't have built-in support for Bokeh. And if it were a closed system, that would be that would be the end of it. That would be, you know, the answer is you you would, would be you couldn't do that. But what you can do instead is drop down to JavaScript and write some write a little piece of little bit of raw HTML and raw JavaScript, and then plug that into your Python code, and then call into JavaScript from Python to create this block of visualization, and then wrap this up in custom component that appears in our toolbox, just like the, you know, the labels and buttons and so on of the standard Anvil components, just now there's Bokeh plot next to it, and you can drag that onto your page. And then you can make that a you know, reusable library so other people can use it. And that's the sort of example of, of what happens. There's a, a, a happy path you can do with nothing but Python. And then when you want something outside the abstraction, the idea is that you can reach down to the lower levels of the stack you know, manipulate the HTML and JavaScript directly, and then bundle that back up, back up into a Python component that you or a colleague or somebody on the internet you've never met can reuse, and now they're staying on the happy path. And is there a particular 
category or set of categories of users that tend to gravitate toward Anvil, either in terms of their background or their needs or use cases? So this is always a fun one because actually talking about the history, we spent a long time trying to guess, you know, what kind of category. And the answer is all sorts of people uh, end up using Anvil for all sorts of things. You know, we've got everybody from uh, one man bands uh, starting startups to, I mean, startups that were started with Anvil and are now substantially larger than one person to big companies to building internal like business workflow apps, uh, you know, data scientists doing visualizations. It's honestly kind of difficult to pin down. But yes, uh, from from literally the smallest to literally the biggest uh, companies on earth have ended up using it, which is quite fun. Um, the thing they tend to have in common, the people who've, who are most enthusiastic about it is they are Pythonists first. So obviously, we get a bunch of data scientists for whom this is an enabling tool. It gives them superpowers, right? One of my favorite stories is actually one of our earlier u- earliest users, a uh, woman by the name of Colette Nataf, who started a, um, well, she was a data scientist by background, maths masters and all that, had been involved in marketing and had an idea for an ad tech company, an algorithm for doing autom- automated A-B tests on your Google and Facebook ads. And she actually had this working and up and outperforming um, the built-in tools and was kind of stuck in consulting land because, you know, she'd have a client who would ask her to do a thing and she would, you know, bring up the script on her laptop and point it at uh, at that client's account and do the ad optimization. Uh, and she needed to have a user interface where clients could do this for themselves in order to become a scalable business. And she looked at, you know, was going to find contractors. It was going to cost her, you know, the best part of a hundred grand to hire somebody to build like the first MVP of a web interface for her. Uh, And of course, you know, everybody knows the first version of something is not the version you're eventually going to want to ship with. You know, you, that was like she was going to have to take a whole round of investment just to make that happen. And the crazy thing is, of course, that wasn't even the difficult part, right? The data science was the difficult part. The machine learning was the difficult part. The web UI was, you know, just having a button that when you click did this thing. And there are, we find there are a lot of people in that situation that actually they need a web UI on the front of something, but the something is much more important. Uh, and so, yes, she ended up finding Anvil, and instead of spending a hundred gram and grand and getting taking months to launch, she launched something within three weeks and was profitable within four. And that's the kind of thing we really, we obviously really love to see. But we do see a lot of people like that. So people with a Python background, or you know, just a scientific background, or a hardware background. And so given the wide variety of backgrounds of the users that you're supporting, I'm curious how you approach overall user experience and usability design in the platform to make sure that they don't run into any roadblocks in the process of trying to get something off the ground. That's a really interesting question, because implicit in that question is this idea that the web is so complicated you sort of have to have, you know, if you're going to make it simpler, you're going to be putting like almost a kid-friendly interface on it. That, you know, this idea that the web is so complicated that any attempt to simplify it must lose so much that it's basically a toy. And I very, very loudly and emphatically disagree with that premise. The complexity in building a web application is like 95 to 99% accidental complexity. It's not necessary and you don't lose any power or expressivity by taking it away. Again, you know, it's always there behind an escape hatch, but you don't lose any power by taking it away. And so it's not the case that there is, you know, that there is a right interface for beginners and a right interface for professionals. Uh, And I think one of the corrosive effects of the web being our primary programming platform you know, for delivering applications today is that people have got it into their heads that anything real, quote unquote, anything that can in fact be distributed to millions of people across the world must be built using a staggeringly complex technology stack. And, you know, for most of computing history, that was not true. Okay, no, for... Okay, since like it, back in the you know the 1970s, you needed to know a lot down to the hardware to get anything done. But certainly since like 
the 90s. It did, it did not have to be that complicated to get something going. And I mean, really, we in the Python community should know this, right? We use a programming language that is the first thing that you teach, you know, a seven-year-old at their first Raspberry Jam. If you don't know about those, those are great events run by the Raspberry Pi Foundation for kids. Uh, if you have a kid, uh, find your lo- your nearest. They are great. But Python is also the programming language used by DeepMind to beat the human brain at Go for the first time ever. And like we are sitting on top of living proof that a well-designed system is accessible enough for novices and powerful enough for seasoned professionals. And it genuinely is just how awful the web is from the usability perspective that has like brainwashed us into thinking that there must be beginner-friendly and pro-friendly interfaces to everything. So the conclusion of that little rant is that the variety of users does not especially feed into the API design for how Amble is constructed. Uh, Our goal is to make a good API and we firmly believe that a good API for a you know component-based user interface uh, is accessible by beginners, and you know we have existence proof of this from the 1990s. And d- if you design that well, that is not going to get in the way of the seasoned professionals either. So we don't really concentrate so much on creating APIs for novices and APIs for professionals. We try to create a good programming environment where the simple things are obvious. And so for somebody who's interested in getting started with Anvil, can you talk through what a typical workflow looks like and is in the process of doing that, talk through the sort of implementation stack of Anvil itself and where it ties into those different touch points? Sure. I think I'll probably go through those separately. So in terms of your workflow, if you're creating an Anvil app, you will start, you'll you know, log in to the Anvil website, uh, you will open up the application builder, you will create a new application. Uh, you'll then be faced uh, with a uh, visual designer to design uh, the user interface of your app and a toolbox on the side. And most likely you will design the first screen of your app by dragging and dropping uh, these components uh, onto your page and then you know changing some of their properties so you know each com- each component like a text box or a button you drag onto the screen you can then go down to the properties window and you know change things like its font size and its alignment and that kind of thing you will then you know respond to an event so when someone clicks on a button at the bottom of the properties window is you know this button what happens when it gets clicked and you click on that and you're now you've now switched from the design you're looking at to a code view which is the code that runs behind that design and every one of these pages these forms we call them again VB heritage is a python class and when you double clicked on that button you created a new method in that python class that was you know my button click uh, and that's the code that gets executed when the button gets clicked and in that code, you will you know, you'll do whatever user interface. You might do some validation. You might pop up a message. You might navigate from one page to another. But if you want to do something on the server, you will make a function call. So anvil.server.call, you'll specify the name of a server function. And then that's just a, it's just like a Python function call. So you can pass arguments, you can pass keyword arguments, and you can get return values from that call. So to implement that server call, uh, you'll create a server module which is they actually they're highlighted differently in the editor you know the yellow background for server code and that's just a python module that runs on our servers in our serverless environment and there you you write ordinary python code but you can define a function you know just def something and then you can decorate it with at anvil.server.callable and that says this is one of those functions you can call with anvil.server.call from the web browser and so you you define a function, you drop this decorator on it, uh, and this function can do whatever, talk to databases, so on, return some values, and then you can go uh, you can go back to your client code. You just call it like it as if it were a function call, any other function call in Python. That's really the core of it. You know, there is 
a vi there is a visual designer, there is code that runs in the browser, there is code that runs on the server. In practice, the first question everybody always asks is, okay, uh, as we discovered when we first put this thing on Reddit, the first thing everybody asks is, so uh, how do I set, how do I use a database? And of course, you can, you know, spin something up uh, in you know, spin a Postgres instance up in Amazon and then connect to it with PsychoPG two because, of course, it's just Python, right? You've got all those libraries at your fingertips. But in practice, we we discovered setting up databases is uh, a lot of, a bit of a pain, and so we actually have a built in built in database service you can just add to your app, and this has like a, a again a point and click interface for creating creating tables uh, and creating columns in those tables and so on. And there's actually a pure Python API for interacting with them. So you can go into your server code and you just go sort of app tables .foo .search or app tables .foo .add row, which has actually has a lot of advantages. It means that we have a straight Python object-based API, which is really cool because we've actually made it so you can return those Python objects. So you can... a an, server function, anvil.server.callable function running on our servers can go look something up in the database and then return that database object. You know, whether it's like a search iterator or a database row, it, you can just return it to the client. You get it as the return value from anvil.server.call in, in the web browser. And so you can do things like accessing and updating your database directly from like the button click handlers in your code because it's just a Python object that you return from a server function and you can live update it. Uh, and this means that you don't have to plumb like every operation in your app through from, you know, all the way from the front end through to the database. Uh, you can, in fact, return the database row or a view of the database as a Python object from the server and interact with it on the client. So that's what a typical, uh, very simple Anvil app will entail, right? It's got a drag and drop designer on the, on the front. Um, Python code running in the browser, uh, server code running in our infrastructure, a database, again, hosted by us, built in, and passing database objects between client and server with these function calls to implement whatever kind of um, uh, storage or display you want to. And the really cool thing about all of that is that because they're all just Python objects, they're all in the same programming environment, right? If you're a web developer, like when was the last time you were working with something that knew your database schema and was able to use that to provide auto-completion in your front-end code, right? It's basically impossible with a modern web stack because your database schema is designed in one programming language. You're reading it in something like Python. You're transmitting it over JSON, uh, you know, interpreting it in JavaScript, and then chucking it into some framework that an auto-completer will have a very hard time understanding. Whereas with Anvil, they are just Python objects and our autocompleter can track them all the way from the database to the front end. So uh, you get all, again, all the luxuries we had in the 1990s, all the luxuries you're familiar with if you use PyCharm on a daily basis, you can actually use in a full stack web application. So yes, designer, front end code, back end code, database as objects you can pass back and forward and it's all autocompleted. Uh, how we implement that uh, which was your second question, is a lot of fun. So obviously, the actual running in the browser and running on the server are very different environments in terms of implementation. Uh, so the, the code you write in the browser is compiled to JavaScript and executes that way. Uh, the code in the server uh, runs you know, uh, in uh, either a uh, sandbox uh, for free users or a... Um, more capable um, full Python interpreter inside a Docker container, inside in a virtual machine, inside you know a lead line box on our servers, and we just have an environment for far farming those out. The function calls from the client to the server, uh, they happen over a custom RPC mechanism over web sockets, and the custom RPC mechanism is what lets us pass back and forth those rich Python objects like database rows. The database itself is backed by Postgres. It's I guess it's actually implemented as a series of calls, just like anvil.server.call calls that are handled by you know the, the central sort of um, uh, Anvil built-in services. So, but of course those are wrapped in Python objects, so you can do things like accessing a database row with square brackets, because of course that is just a, a call to the Dunder get item function. So that's that's a sort of the the, the skimmed the skimmed view. Oh, I, I could talk a little bit more about the client-side stuff. So 
all those components you've been dragging and dropping onto your page, so the buttons and the text boxes and so on, are actually the Python objects. So if I want to you know, change the text on a label, which is text component, or if I want to get the text that's in a text box, you just go self.textbox1.text. You know, it's just a Python object with an attribute. And when you go and select that text box and scroll down in the properties window in the visual designer, uh, you're just editing the attributes of that Python object. And that's, that's an example of what I mean about, you know, that's an API design that is pretty accessible to someone who's just started, who, you know, if you know about Python objects and you understand they have attributes, then self.textbox1.text will make perfect sense. But that is also a really good interface for driving things from an expert level, because of course you can, you know, dynamically create these objects and add them to your, uh, you know, and add them to containers on your form. The drag and drop designer is, of course, just a shorthand for all the ways that you could construct your um, interface with code. Which means that, again, by making them Python objects, they are directly manipulable. You can drive them in all sorts of interesting ways, but there's a drag and drop interface and easy way of using them. And those Python objects are, of course, uh, they are implemented because they have to be, they are accessible from this Python that has been compiled into JavaScript. They are implemented in JavaScript as part of our Anvil runtime and made accessible via sort of foreign function interface into um, Sculpt, which is the Python to JavaScript compiler we use on the client. Yeah, I was going to ask about whether you use a sort of ready, readily available JavaScript transpiler that's just pip installable, or if you were building something custom for your own purposes. So I'm curious what your selection criteria was for determining uh, sort of which path to go down and which library to use. So yeah, so we use uh, Sculpt, which is an existing open source Python to JavaScript compiler. There are, as you allude to, a few of these about actually my colleague, Sean Taylor Morgan, that has written a comparison of Python in the browser mechanisms uh, for Python tips that you might want to put in the show notes. Some of these Python environments, they're meant as kind of drop-in replacements for JavaScript, right? If you look at something like Brython, right? Brython's big sell is that you can do script type equals text slash Python, and then you, in your HTML, in angle brackets, and then you can write some Python in your web, web page. And that's Cool if you want to use Python instead of JavaScript, but it doesn't fundamentally change the paradigm of how you're using the web, right? You are accessing the HTML DOM the same as you do in JavaScript, right? You know, you have a document object. And so it hasn't actually raised the level of abstraction. It's just swapped out a language from JavaScript to Python. And we, we you know, we were more, wanted to be more ambitious than that because that, you know, those layers of abstraction and the need to transform your data into 50 different forms between server and client is a large part of the problem. And so something like Brython, although it is absolutely awesome, you should totally check it out, doesn't actually solve that problem. And so we chose Sculpt because Sculpt was a originally created for educational purposes. It deliberately, it's not meant for as a JavaScript replacement. It's meant as a Python implementation you can use in the browser in JavaScript, because obviously, you know, you don't want, again, because you don't want people who are learning Python for the first time to have to interact with HTML, because that is asking for a migraine. So instead, it's a Python interpreter that you can then, you know, provide modules and objects for interacting with the outside world in whatever way you see fit. Uh, And so that's what we did. We, you know, we used a Python runtime environment and then we provided objects for you know components on the screen and so on that you could interact with uh, so that we could provide a Pythonic interface rather than writing Python, but still having to wrangle basically everything else as if you were JavaScript. And on the server side, I'm curious what you've chosen for your technology stack there. And also, I know that particularly for the shared environments, you pre-install a number of additional Python dependencies that people can take advantage of. And so I'd also like to hear what your strategy is as far as managing version upgrades without breaking your customers' applications. So on the server side, uh, we actually we use a, a couple of technologies. Um, for free users, we use the PyPy sandbox because that is a very low cost sandboxing me- method, which means that we can support thousands of uh, free users. For uh, paid users, 
we use a you know, full Python 3 or Python 2 interpreter running, um, say, inside, you know, isolated in a virtual machine. And for those, we, we ship them with, as you say, like a, a default set of, uh, set of libraries. And those libraries do... Uh, do we do update from time to time we currently do run on like a standard a a, a standard requirements.txt effectively uh, we don't personalize those yet although that is something that i'm looking forward to on the um uh, something i am looking forward to on the roadmap um but at the moment there are just upgrades and uh, you can if you're a paid user uh, sort of ask me ask us to tell you uh, when something uh you know when certain of your dependencies that you need change. Uh, we don't currently have a good uh, change management process for that yet, but that is something that is uh, is on its way. So watch this space. Um, and so for the server side, I'm curious what the environment is that customers are using for running their code there. So whether it's like a Flask app or a Django app under the covers, or if you have built some homegrown web framework for uh, Anvil in order to be able to support the WebSocket communications or uh, what sort of combination of t uh, technologies you're using to build that. Ah, uh, right. So um, the code that you're writing on the server is absolutely not a Django or Flask or standard web application. Um, the, as I say, it's an in, it's a serverless environment where the way to talk to the client is to expose at amble.server.callable um, functions. So what actually happens is that when you open an an Anvil application in your browser, that makes its WebSocket connection to a like a, a piece of central routing infrastructure that we maintain and that says oh well you know that that request is for this app and you know it's not to one of our internal built-in handlers therefore it's going to be executing in the server-side uh, python environment therefore root over there to that node which is you know which is hosting a live server-side environment for um that app and so this is that part is all uh, is custom so what actually what's actually running inside that vm is a uh yeah, it is a custom Python environment that connects up to this, you know, this routing infrastructure and um, distributes requests accordingly. Having said which, you can, of course, build uh, functions that responds directly to HTTP endpoints as well. So uh, you can interact with your Anvil app. Actually, as a more general point, you can interact with your Anvil app by many means other than just opening a web browser, right? Obviously, that's the primary way that people use many anvil apps but you know you can put throw together an http api so you can make you can tag a function at anvil.server.http endpoint instead of callable and that says that's like a like a flask route um, that will respond to certain http requests to your app you can also actually uh, use something called the uplink which i'm surprised i haven't mentioned sooner which is is a way of hooking a piece of code running on your computer or computer you control into um, this same like uh, this same request for routing infrastructure. So what you do is you launch any Python environment on your computer. You know maybe it's a standalone Python script running as a daemon. Maybe it's inside a, a Jupyter notebook. Maybe it's just a REPL running on your machine. And you pip install the Anvil uplink, uh, and then you go anvil.server.connect with a key that is unique to your application. And when you do that, um, your code, wherever it's running, on your laptop or on your server, connects up to this central you know, routing infrastructure. And then you can locally on your machine create an anvil.server.callable function and call that from, you know, from the front end, from other server modules, and you're, you, know, you are there, you are executing. It's like part of your app. You, know, you can, from your own laptop, you can access the built-in database with the same API as you can from server for, server code. You can write HTTP endpoints. You can anvil.server.call into the server infrastructure and so on. So yeah, I, that's significantly more powerful than the server side code just being a wrapped up Django app. And as far as building and growing the Anvil platform and company, I'm wondering what have been some of the biggest challenges that you've faced in the process? Ooh, so, I mean, one of the biggest challenges is when you're building a develop. it's just that it's so big, right? When you're building a developer tool, nobody wants something that that is half working. It needs to cover pretty much all the bases before it's usable for anything. So certainly one of the biggest challenges was 
building a platform this large from scratch. And that was why it was so great for us to build it slowly and not have this pressure of, you know, seed funding that's going to run out. So that would be one of the biggest ones. I'd say the second biggest challenge is sort of ex getting the word out there and explaining it. Because we go, you, you know, we, we met at PyCon just a couple of weeks ago. And when we actually show Anvil to people and see a demo, you know, our, our booth gets piled three deep and it's all very satisfying. But it is, it's a little bit like the Matrix. You know, it is difficult to explain, easy to show. And so our, our biggest challenge is really, as always, I suppose, with programming, it is all about communication and education and communicating what it's about and how to use it. Technical challenges, there have been uh, lots and they've been uh, fun. I have one of my first uh, significant externally visible acts as part of creating Anvil was modifying the Python to JavaScript compiler sculpt we use. So I mentioned earlier that those anvil.server.call calls, um, those are blocking calls, right? You, you can get a, re a return value from an anvil.server.call, which is really neat for writing idiomatic Python uh, on the front end. It was really important. It turns out that that was not uh, natively supported by um, Sculpt when we started this, uh, because, of course, JavaScript is a non-blocking language. And so uh, I had an enormous amount of fun uh, modifying the um, Sculpt compiler to support producing blocking code and how that interacted with JavaScript. I actually gave a lightning talk at PyCon 2017 about that, that I would love to send you a link to. But ultimately, and there are lots more like that, but ultimately the technical challenges were, as always, uh, nowhere near uh, as much of a challenge as the human challenges. Uh, one of the things that starting a startup as an engineer does is it takes you way outside your comfort zone because, of course, if you just stayed in your comfort zone cranking out software, you could create a marvel that nobody else sees. And there's uh, fundamentally the good you do for the universe uh, is sort of limited that way. And as far as just the overall features and capabilities of Anvil, I'm wondering what are some of the ones that are often either overlooked or underused or misunderstood that you think users would benefit from knowing more about? So I've previously talked about the uplink. I think that's a thing that is often difficult com to communicate without a demo. And then you sort of see a light bulb go on behind people's eyes and they go, oh my God, that's exactly the thing I needed. We say so we try to make specific things not difficult to understand but there is a lot of depth to anvil and if you sort of talk about all the depth up front then you will sort of necessarily overwhelm somebody so there's you know there's lots of little things in the background like there there are whole features like you know the uplink or like the fact that you can create http apis that we kind of don't hit you over the head with um, as you first turn up because uh, you're already taking in this idea that, wait, hold on, I don't actually have to write HTML and CSS and JavaScript for everything. I can just drag and drop some Python components in. That's cool. So I think a lot of the, the, so the supporting infrastructure, things that you don't need until you need them and then you really need them. So like ability to respond to HTTP endpoints is a classic version of that. Uh, the uplink is a classic version of that. Some people never have to use it. Some people have like a sensitive database that absolutely must stay inside their corporate network and they just need to be able to expose function calls in their app that run queries against this database. And so I could, you know, I could, I could list them all Part of the problem is that there are uh, that there are so many of them that you can't sort of list them all at people without their eyes going slightly glazed. <laughs> and so, as you mentioned, you have worked very hard to make sure that Anvil can be used from the smallest to the largest customer and that there are escape hatches to be able to reach outside of Anvil to be able to do things custom. But I'm wondering what the overall limitations are of the platform that you've built and when it would be the wrong choice for somebody. So right now, I mean, this is, this is obviously you're asking me for, this is a quite a painful question because, as I say, uh, anything that it's the wrong choice for is on some level a bug report. Nevertheless, right now, Anvil is not particularly useful for heavily real-time applications. We don't have a lot of like streaming 
uh, streaming to the browser to support. Again, we have sort of designs for how to support that, but it's not implemented yet. As I say, like content heavy websites. So because Anvil is geared towards single page applications, then serving you know, serving like a, a news website or a blog off Anvil is not currently very well aligned with what Anvil does. Those are the two examples that spring to mind. But as I say, uh, everything that doesn't work in Anvil yet is a bug report that we will get around to fixing. And you mentioned a couple of times some of the ideas that you have for the roadmap. And I'm curious if you can talk through what you see as being the future of Anvil, both from the technical and the business side. So... From the technical side, we try not to talk too much about the roadmap for the simple reason that you can sort of never win that way. If you say something is coming and then it's uh, then it is late, then you've broken a promise. And if you come up with you know something that's actually new and better and much more important, and you do that instead, well, you ended up still breaking a promise. And that might overshadow you having done something cool. So we try to avoid giving too many hostages to fortune on the roadmap, uh, certainly to people who don't have support contracts with us. On the business side, though, there are, you know, if you if you look at it in the market, there are roughly two ways to sell software. You can go out and convince all the people that might use your software that this will be really good and uh, fun and stress relieving to use and will help them in their day-to-day -day lives and so on. Or you can go to their boss's boss's boss in a company and take them golfing. And the incentives that those two systems of selling software provide to the quality of the software that results, the legendary within the community, a lot of software, not all of it, but a lot of software that gets sold to bosses, bosses, bosses ends up not being that fun to use because that's not what it's being optimized for. And so the biggest thing we are focused on uh, in the business is we do actually, and it's a bit grandiose to say it, but it is actually ultimately what we're aiming for is we are trying to fix web development. And if you just fix web development for the Fortune 100, then you have not in fact fixed web development. So we want to continue to remain something that is widely usable by a developer who wants to throw something together and can pick up Anvil and just you know, do it in an afternoon uh, without talking to procurement first. And one thing that I didn't ask yet, but that I'm curious about is how you ended up selecting the name for the business and the platform. So an Anvil is a tool you find in a workshop. It's something big, it's something solid, and you use it to build other things on top of it. Uh, plus, the domain name was free. And so are there any other aspects of Anvil or the work that you're trying to do to address some of the pain points and shortcomings of web development or anything else about the business or the technology that we didn't discuss that you'd like to cover before we close out the show? I think I've said a lot of what I want to say. I think web development as currently conceived is... It is massively liberating in some ways because it has, you know, compared with 20 years ago, it's leveled the playing field. It's allowed pretty much anybody to make an app that pretty much anybody else in the world can use. And that was a genuine good thing it did for us compared with what we had in the 1990s. But because it did that one thing, one really good thing for us, we have let it get away with a lot. We've let it get away with being hostile to beginners, frankly, hostile to experts. And I think we've become so used to the idea that anything full scale requires that level of complexity that we flinch from anything trying to make it simpler because you know we're so used to this level of complexity that we think that anything making it simpler must be turning it into some Fisher-Price toy. And... This is a legitimate fear. And you look at some of the systems out there that try to make this easier. And, you know, you can find a lot of enterprise drag and dropware that promises you can build applications without writing any code. And sure, yes, that is turning the web into a Fisher Price toy. But you don't have to do that. You can build something with an industrial strength programming language that keeps all the power that you enjoyed having as a programmer and takes away the wrestling your data into five different formats and mashing it into json and writing the same piece of, uh, writing the same operation five times just to build a basic application and i've said it before and i'll say it again we're pythonists 
we know that this is possible. We know that simplicity does not mean lack of power. And uh, yeah, we want to convince people that that is true for the web as well, or rather to show them. And for anybody who does want to get in touch with you or follow along with the work that you're doing, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And with that, I'll move us into the picks. And this week, I'm going to choose a project called Pipex that I started using recently. And it's a simple command line tool for being able to install any sort of Python application or command line tool or binary into a its own virtual environment and then it exposes it to your shell environment so that it makes it very easy to use some of these command line scripts you know from your terminal without having to go through a lot of setup or maintain different virtual environments or have it pollute your overall system packages uh, so it's been very useful for me so it's definitely worth a look if that's something that you have found yourself battling with and so with that i'll pass it to you Meredith. do you have any picks this week i'm going to have to choose sculpt the python to javascript compiler we use i'm sort of using it here as a synodosh for any of this uh, any of these uh, environments that allow you to write python in the browser because i do think that it's a big step forwards and some of them are small steps in that they are adding choice of choice of language from you know adding choice of language in the browser instead of everyone being forced into javascript and some of them are really exciting changes to how web development can be done uh, there's actually as I say i'll point you at the uh, comparative python in the browser article uh, written by my colleague sean because i think that's a really interesting overview of where this space is going and i think it is very exciting and it just got more complicated too with WebAssembly making it possible to have other languages running in your javascript runtime oh yeah well this is i mean that that's the the real goal have you uh, seen PyIodide, which is this awesome project that just puts an entire uh, full-size Python data analysis environment into a web browser using WebAssembly. It is it, it is beautiful, and that's yeah, that's the kind of power that uh, I yeah really excited about what WebAssembly can do. Yeah, I've seen that come up, and uh, I've taken taken a brief look, but haven't dug too deep into it. But I'll definitely add a link to the show notes for anybody who wants to take a look at that on their own. And so, I'd like to thank you for taking the time today to join me and talk about the work that you're doing at Anvil. It's definitely a very ambitious project, and it looks like you've been able to uh, enjoy a good deal of success and add a lot of polish and usability to web development. So. Thank you for all of that. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's been great talking to you.